Thank you all for being here this afternoon. We're really honored that Bill Gates has chosen to come to Stanford for the first university stop on his virtual book tour. And I'm so pleased that so many of you could join us for this virtual conversation. The last 12 months have been a time of great uncertainty and disruption from work and school to gathering with friends and family, nearly every aspect of our lives has been upended. But the upheaval we faced over the last year may be minor compared to what we could face in the decades to come if climate change continues unabated. Climate change has been called COVID in slow motion. Like COVID-19, addressing climate change requires that we change human behaviors at the same time as we deploy new technological solutions to tackle the crisis. And like COVID-19, climate change is a crisis that transcends borders. It's a global challenge, one that will require the best minds from across disciplines to work together to find solutions. While solving the climate crisis may seem like a daunting task, this year has also shown us what we can achieve. For example, to create and deploy novel vaccines at breakneck speed in less than 12 months, when we focus our attention and our resources on the great challenges before us. Over the last several years, faculty in Stanford schools and institutes have made tremendous strides in understanding the science of climate change and in developing innovative green technologies. In particular, the Precourt Institute for Energy, led by Yi Shui, and the Woods Institute for the Environment, led by Chris Field, have played key roles as hubs for interdisciplinary research and education. Researchers affiliated with both institutes have advanced knowledge related to sustainability and climate change sparking discoveries across disciplines and leading to new solutions. But the scale and the timeframe of the crisis demand more. Last May, we announced our intention to develop a new school focused on climate and sustainability in order to amplify our contributions to solving this great challenge. Deans Cam Moeller and Steve Graham are leading a large effort involving many faculty to define the blueprint for that school. We're building on the achievements of our institutes and the contributions of our School of Earth, Energy and Environmental Sciences and of departments in our other schools, such as Civil and Environmental Engineering, our Ecology and Evolution Group and others to create a school that brings together many of Stanford's existing strengths in climate and sustainability and to build on them. The school will include an accelerator to drive new solutions through external partnerships and scale them for the world. Climate change is the defining issue of the 21st century and we're putting our resources to work to meet it. As we consider the ch challenge ahead and the work needed to tackle it, we're so fortunate to have Bill Gates join us for this timely discussion today. We all know Bill as the co-founder of Microsoft and for his work with the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. For years, Bill and Melinda have put their resources and platform to great use to tackle global health and development issues. But what some of you may not know is that Bill has also spent more than a decade focusing on the issue of climate change. He studied climate change in detail, everything from the carbon intensive processes for manufacturing steel and cement, to the policies we need to deploy clean energy innovations at scale, to the impact of energy poverty on the world's poorest. And now he's written a book, How to Avoid a Climate Disaster, The Solutions We Have and the Breakthroughs We Need. I'm thrilled to have Bill join us today for a conversation about what we can do to help the world avoid that climate disaster. He'll be joined for the conversation by Arun Majumdar, the J. Precourt Provost Hill Chair Professor at Stanford and Professor of Mechanical Engineering. Before coming to Stanford, Arun was appointed by President Obama as the founding director of the US Department of Energy's Advanced Research Projects Agency, Energy. He also served as the Acting Undersecretary of Energy under President Obama, and he led President Biden's Department of Energy transition team. And now a short video will set the stage, stage for the conversation. Thank you. In a typical year, the world emits over 51 billion tons of greenhouse gases. And as we keep doing that, the consequences for human life will be catastrophic. When I first fell in love with computers as a teenager, they were enormous, expensive, and only the government and big companies could afford them. But my friends and I became obsessed with a wild idea. What could we do if there was a computer on every desk? And now the wild idea 
is quite tame. Billions of people not only have computers on their desks, but even in their pockets. Now the world needs another breakthrough. In fact, it needs many breakthroughs. We need to get from 51 billion tons to zero while still meeting the planet's basic needs. That means we need to transform the way we do almost everything. Our commitment to developing these innovations will mean the difference between a future where everyone can live a healthy, productive life and one where we're constantly dealing with the human and financial crises at a historic scale. Entrepreneurs and investors have to build new businesses and change existing businesses to get these solutions deployed. Government leaders have to enact new policies that drive the market for clean energy. And advocates have to keep their voices loud to hold all of us accountable for rapid progress. Avoiding a climate disaster will be one of the greatest challenges humans have ever taken on. Greater than landing on the moon, greater than eradicating smallpox, even greater than putting a computer on every desk. Now my basic optimism about climate change comes from my belief in innovation. It's our power to invent that makes me hopeful. Bill, thank you for joining us. And Mark, thank you for that introduction. Um, Bill, you have written this outstanding uh, comprehensive book on an issue that will impact every human being in the world. And as Mark said, it is the defining issue of the 21st century. So while reading your book, I started put, putting um, you know, these pink sticky notes out here and here we have, it's filled with them. And um, on, on things that I found interesting that resonated with me, and there are like almost hundred of them. I'm not gonna ask you hundred questions, <laughs> but I'm gonna ask you sort of the key messages. And there are six student questions that, that I definitely wanna get to. First of all, your personal journey. Um, your focus on climate change started with the awareness of energy poverty um, through your work, through your foundation that took you to places that didn't have electricity, didn't have lights. And that started about 20 years ago. David McKay of Cambridge University was a big influence on you as well. So how did you connect the dots between energy and climate? And why did you write this book at this time? As you said, uh, it's through the work of the Gates Foundation traveling uh, throughout Africa in uh, uh, after the year 2000, uh, where I saw that uh, not only was there very little electricity and uh, none of it reliable, uh, but also people were talking about uh, that growing their crops was getting more difficult, uh, that there were more floods, but also more droughts. And that confused me and I realized, okay, uh, I need to dig in and understand climate change. And fortunately, um, uh, Ken Caldera, who's uh, connected to Stanford, and David Keith uh, volunteered to help do six half-day sessions a year uh, to explain things like uh, carbon capture and climate models and ocean circulation, permafrost, all sorts of things that I hadn't focused on before. And so the, the next milestone after uh, those learnings was that I uh, helped start a nuclear fission company, TerraPower, and I gave a TED Talk in 2010. Now that TED Talk has been viewed about a 20th as much now as the 2015 pandemic TED Talk uh, that I gave later. Sadly, most of those views are after the pandemic started, not uh, when it uh, could have gotten us uh, prepared. In 2015, uh, there was a big milestone, which was the Paris meeting. And I was kind of disappointed that the metrics uh, that were employed there were just these near-term reductions. And I'm, I think that is great. You gotta push for the things that are ready to go, whose extra costs, what I call green premium, are modest. You wanna push those out like electric cars and wind and solar. But if you're just focusing on, on that, it is, it's though the problem isn't to get to 100%. So you don't <clears throat> incent working on the hard parts, the parts uh, where the extra cost, that green premium is super high. And so Mission Innovation was a side event uh, where countries, including President Obama, President Modi, uh, we had great uh, involvement committed to double energy R&D budgets. And I committed to create a uh, high-risk capital uh, venture type funding 
uh, called Breakthrough Energy Ventures, uh, so that if there were good ideas in the labs, uh, green investing, which was faltering at the time because of uh, some failures there, uh, that that would be there. Uh, so that you know kind of brings us up to the present. Breakthrough Energy Ventures has done well. I actually was amazed in 2019 to see that the young generation is caring more and more and speaking out more and more about this issue. And the goal to try to get to zero by 2050 is the right goal, but I just didn't see a plan, particularly as you think about all the different sources of emissions and uh, how you know we're gonna measure, are we doing the right things? And uh, uh, I delayed the book a year because when the pandemic hit, uh, you know there was such uncertainty uh, I wanted my uh, anything I did publicly to be about the pandemic all last year. Uh, but then after the election, you know, with Biden coming in, with European recovery money going towards climate, with this Glasgow event coming up in November, I thought, gosh, if, if we're going to take this opportunity to build back uh, and put it into climate related things, you know, let's start a debate about what a full plan would look like. Uh, and you know how do you accelerate uh, innovation uh, to with this you know very very challenging deadline? Well, let's talk about scale because this is something that um, you you mention a lot. We have I don't think we have ever done anything like this before. You start your book with two numbers: fifty-one billion and zero. The world is emitting fifty-one billion tons of CO two equivalent, and we need to get to zero by twenty fifty onwards. Um, and what is often lost on people is what is 51 billion? And he uses this wonderful example of fish swimming in water. I suppose we are swimming in fossil fuels. How big is this? Well, it's, it's kind of mind blowing. It's kind of too bad. It's a, you know, transparent uh, gas, you can't smell it. Uh, but it does have this uh, effect of causing more heat to stay trapped uh, in the atmosphere. You know, that if we didn't have any CO2, actually the earth would be uh, way too cold, but here we're very quickly changing the temperature and both nat natural ecosystems, our crops, the, the days at the equator uh, where humans just can't deal with the temperature and humidity, uh, you know, that is a very uh, scary thing. And so, you know, and zero, uh, you know, sadly, CO2 just stays up in the atmosphere for thousands of years. And so over any near term, you basically sum all those CO2 emissions. It doesn't really matter which year they're in. And of course, the, that 51 billion, if you look at it by years, it, it just goes up. Even this year, uh, well, 2020, it was less than a 10% a reduction in emissions, despite, you know, people staying at home and you know, tourism being absolutely crushed uh, because of, you know, all those different activities, it, it, you know, we almost need that kind of reduction every year now to get from this increase all the way down uh, to zero at, at 2050. So, you know, anyone who thinks it's going to be easy, uh, hopefully the book will convince them uh, that it's going to be hard and that 2050 is the soonest we could get it done. Anyone who thinks it's impossible, hopefully I give examples from uh, you know, the digital world that moves so quickly or uh, some of the work at the foundation where innovation has actually gone better than we expected. We've saved a lot more children's lives than we would have projected partly because of, of new vaccines. So you know, it's, it, we've got to enlist everyone in this very, very hard work. So that actually brings to the first student question. You know, we're gonna have 10 billion people in the world by 2050, 2 billion more than today. That's more than India or China. Um, and our first student question is, where will they live? So let's get Alex's question. Hi, Mr. Gates. Thanks for taking my question. My name is Alex Nukovich, and I'm a PhD candidate in civil engineering here at Stanford, doing research on developing data-driven tools to improve urban building energy efficiency. My question for you is this. By 2050, over two thirds of the world's population will be living in cities. How do you envision technological advancements like AI, internet of things, and the digitization of information will improve the sustainability and quality of life for people living in cities? And how can we ensure that we do this ethically and responsibly? Thanks. 
Yeah, so population growth, uh, as we go from a bit over 7 billion today uh, to 10 billion, uh, Asia goes from 4 billion to 5 billion. Uh, the thing that's a bit daunting is that Africa goes from a billion to 3 billion, and the rest of the continents actually are a slight net shrinkage, including Europe uh, and the Americas. And so the babies are being born in the toughest place on earth. Um, you know, it's, it's an amazing fact that really is what got me into global health work was that as you uh, improve children's survival, parents choose voluntarily to have less children. And so it's only the continent where uh, 15 to 20% of, of kids die before the age of five in the toughest areas that we still have this huge population growth. So, uh, you know, improving health should bring that growth rate down. Uh, there's some disagreement when you do these projections on will it be uh, Africa get to three billion, three and a half. You know, we haven't seen the bend in the curve there that we've seen elsewhere. Uh, and of course, if you have climate change and it's creating instability, that's gonna be a negative feedback uh, to that population growth uh, as well. So huge problem, as the questioner said, uh, people are moving into cities. So you have more people and you'll have more services per person, basic shelter, air conditioning. Uh, so that's gonna go up as well. You know, people as they're better off, they eat more meat, which, you know, that's a, a challenge for global food production. And so, the overall equation, even if the rich world cuts back on its use, uh, you know, smaller houses and cars, uh, just for justice alone, we need more buildings, more electricity. Uh, and so just, you know, uh, reducing consumption is not a path to serve. It can help. And, you know, I'm, I'm all for it, where, particularly where it's inefficient. Uh, the other part of the question was the use of digital technologies. It is amazing some of the efficiency you can get by monitoring, you know, when uh, you need to use power, you know, getting data that says, okay, why are we so inefficient at how we use this power? So people in the digital world uh, can make huge contributions, potentially even fundamental contributions about material science and catalysts that uh, whether it's with quantum computing or other techniques, the sciences now are very digital, uh, you know, simulating the grid. We have an open source model that's going to help people think through the grid. Likewise, our nuclear reactor, that only exists in digital form. So people in AI and computer science can make huge contributions to these innovations. So let me move on to innovations. Um, like you said, I mean, you have clearly stated in the book that we need new technologies and other innovations, policy innovations as well to address climate change because we don't have all the solutions. Wind, solar, and EVs are not gonna get us to zero. You talk about the industry, cement and steel, then food and agriculture, transportation. And, and I like the way you framed it in terms of how do you pick innovations? There are like five questions. And how much of the 51 billion are we going to get to? How much space will it require? And you pay a special emphasis to green premium. So explain all of that in the context of the next question by Mayank. Hi, Bill. Thank you for your work on climate change. My name is Mayank Gerda, and I'm a Sloan Fellow at Stanford's Graduate School of Business, focusing on climate tech ventures. As a key stakeholder in tackling climate change, you must come across a huge number of ideas to address climate change, ranging from technological innovations to new co-venture ideas to holistic climate plans. What are the key questions or considerations that you recommend we use to assess various climate ideas and plans, particularly given the multidisciplinary nature and many layers of complexity involved in addressing climate change? Thank you. Yeah, so that's a question that you know we've had to look at in doing uh, breakthrough energy ventures, uh, and you know, Arun, when you were uh, running RPE, you got off you know to a great start at reminding people it's not just the few things uh, that uh, come to mind immediately. It's very, very broad. And in areas like steel and cement, the amount of innovation, the amount of R and D, has been pretty modest because the costs are low, the current products work, the building standards actually are pretty hard uh, set about 
the exact recipe you use uh, for those products. So to re-energize those fields and say, no, you know, we need to do it a, a different way, uh, that, um, you, you know, it's surprising that we, ha we have to go back and change that. And the scale of it is, is really mind blowing. The green premium uh, is in some ways a very obvious concept, but not uh, discussed much in the past. I, I have a slide with the uh, two examples on it. You know, for an electric car, if you buy it today, you pay more upfront, you save, you save some because your electricity is cheaper than gasoline and your maintenance is less, but you give up range, uh, it takes more time to charge. But we can see as the volume's going up, you have lots of companies like QuantumScape and many others that are working on those batteries. The costs will come down, range will come up, we'll have charging station and eventually quick charging. And so although the green premium is, is like 15% extra today, uh, over time, uh, you know, even a company like General Motors can say, no, we're not going to make these gasoline cars anymore because uh, the electric car will be uh, uh, preferable without a premium, without even taking into account the fact that, assuming the grid has gotten to zero, uh, that's a, a zero emissions activity. So if we could take every area of emissions and do that, you know, get the green premium down to zero, uh, then we win, you know, and so when we talk to say India in 2015, we say, please use green steel, green cement. Uh, you know, if the premium is still high, they're gonna send, say, send us the trillions of dollars because you historically emitted more and we need to deal with basics here. We're not as rich as you, we're not responsible. And that, you know, I don't think at the current level, which is many trillions, that's doable. The other example is cement uh, where a ton of cement is only $125. I was amazed uh, some markets is even cheaper than that. But because you get a ton of carbon emission for every ton of cement, it's almost double the price. And so, uh, you know, there's no market for something that costs twice as much. And yet, as companies come in and slightly reduce this, we need to make a, a market so we get scale and learning and competition so that the same magic that happened for solar, the lithium ions come to uh, the innovations in, in cement making. So let me switch to um, innovation. You, you talked about in your book, innovation supply and innovation demand. The R&D can help to reduce the green premium and create an innovation supply, but we cannot forget about the innovation demand. And so, and you also talked about electricity a lot because as you said in your book, you got to elect, you got to decarbonize the grid and then electrify as much as you can. So in the context of the electricity sector, and you know, we know we need new storage solution, long duration, we need nuclear, we need carbon capture. But in that context, tell us about how you view the innovation supply and how do you create the innovation demand for those technologies? The expansion of the electric generation actually stunned me. Uh, now, it should have been obvious because the energy has got to come from somewhere. So if it's not coming from gasoline to power a car, natural gas to heat a house, uh, which turns out to be a lot of energy, uh, you know, where's it going to come from? Well, it's got to come from a green source and electricity, which fortunately we can move around. Uh, once we solve that, then it's usable against many of these areas. But with a huge growth. And of course, hydro isn't going to grow. It's our main green source of energy today, but we've tapped out, at least in North America, all of the, the significant opportunities there. So, you know, the solution certainly is mostly renewables, uh, you know, probably 80% renewables. But if you work that out, we'll have to build renewables a lot faster uh, than we are even today, you know, when it feels like, wow, uh, we're being very aggressive. We'll probably have to have offshore wind in there as well. We'll have to have lots of transmission. Uh, you know, we see a cold front over the Midwest right now. And, you know, that, uh, although the reason Texas doesn't have power is because they didn't weatherize their natural gas plants and the wind and the, even one of the reactors tripped because of a sensor uh, not being weatherized properly. Uh, so that's not a case of 
of a problem with renewables, even though some people have suggested that. But the idea that that intermittent sources create a reliability problem, that is legitimate. Uh, and so the o open source model uh, that we're putting out there for people to play around with lets you say, okay, how do you, how do you deal with very tough weather events, which for the US, it's either a heat wave or a cold front over the Midwest is a challenge there. We need a miracle on energy storage, uh, which it's way too expensive for the electric grid right now. Uh, and we probably, uh, unless that miracle surprises us, we will need something that's not weather dependent and it's large scale green energy, which nuclear fission, uh, assuming fusion doesn't uh, surprise us and mature quickly, that's the most likely way uh, to get that. So it's the grid opportunity uh, is there, uh, but you know it's gonna take a lot of investment, a lot of uh, new regulations to let transmission get done. Uh, and, and so it, it is a centerpiece of the solution. Actually, that brings to the next question, and we're going to have the next student question. It's about infrastructure. Even if we had this, the grid solutions ready today, the storage solutions and all, you and I have chatted. We have had um, at least one session on how difficult it is to build transmission lines. So uh, that brings us to the next question from EJ. Thank you so much for taking my question. My name is EJ and I'm a graduate student here at Stanford focusing on decarbonizing large scale energy systems. What has struck me about the transition needed is the infrastructure and investment that will be required to support the transition. So my question is, what are ways we can mobilize capital for different solutions at all different scales from nascent technologies to large scale deployment? Well, one program uh, that has been very successful uh, and stayed intact even the last four years is the tax credits uh, for solar and wind. Uh, we have to give credit to Japan and Germany who put on uh, tax credits, uh, particularly for solar, but also for wind and started to bootstrap that market. But then the US came in uh, with an aggressive plan. And so that's really driven things forward at quite an aggressive rate. And the beauty of that is as the volume's gone up, uh, the cost of those things has come down even more than at least I expected uh, they would, particularly in the case of, of solar. And so now over time, not yet, but over time, we may be able to shift those subsidies to more earlier stage things like storage, offshore wind, carbon capture uh, that we still don't have yet. Uh, the whole planning process for the grid used to be very local, you know, a state utility commission would say, okay, build a coal plant or not. Uh, and it wasn't really that much of a national problem. If you're generating massive renewables out of the Midwest, then you need a plan. You know, how does it get out to the coasts? And uh, you need to incent the states in the middle to feel like, okay, uh, you know, that it's okay to have transmission here. There are some ideas about using less space to do lots of transmission, you know, superconducting and things. We can't count on necessarily uh, that that's going to work. The finance industry, you know, isn't, uh, you know, gonna give us dramatically better pricing for the money. Uh, so we have to take some of that risk out. Often the government, uh, you know, will have to be the first dollars in on nuclear. That's been uh, very, very important. Uh, but the you know packaging it up, uh, and so the signal is clear to the utilities, which have been fairly conservative, and the utility commissions that uh, give them permission. We're not there yet. Uh, we're not there on on the national overall plan, nor on the the transmission piece. Let me switch to a different topic, and that's um, food and agriculture. Uh, your chapter on how we grow things really resonated with me. Because when I was in ARPA-E, I constantly used the example of the Haber-Bosch process for artificial fertilizers uh, to set the bar for ARPA-E. That's what we, the kind of innovation that we need. And that was arguably the most important innovation of the 20th century that is most people have not heard of. And, and we won't be alive without that, that innovation, the nitrogen from in, in the soil. And then uh, in a Norman Borlaug, you used the example of Borlaug in the 1960s and 70s for the dwarf strains of wheat 
uh, for which he got the Nobel Prize in Peace. And it proved Paul Ehrlich wrong. And you, you, you talked about that too. And I'm a living example of Borlaug's innovation. I wouldn't be alive if it was not for him. I grew up in India. Um, so now looking ahead with the current techniques in modern biology, like gene editing and other things, should we be looking at a second green revolution to address both food and climate and collectively? If so, what would it look like in your mind? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you know, in climate, you've got both the mitigation, which is this idea of reducing emissions, and you've got adaptation, which is helping the uh, people who are being negatively affected already. And agriculture plays a central role in adaptation and a significant role, 19% uh, of emissions in mitigation. And having more productive seeds and seeds that can deal with higher temperatures, uh, can deal with drought, because sadly the you know, center of continents will be drying out with that ex uh, extra heat, uh, but other parts will get floods more than they have in the past because it'll uh, it it that that rain will go will go somewhere, and so it blows my mind that we only fund the seed innovation system for the world, which is called the CG system, at less than a billion a year. Uh, there is so much promise, as you say, with these gene editing techniques, not only for disease protection and specific per crop type productivity. Uh, but the Gates Foundation is funding scientists who are even working on photosynthesis itself. You know, for example, when it's too sunny, the plant likes to shut down and it likes to wait, you know, because it's, it's not, evolution didn't optimize it to make the biggest seeds possible. It's optimized for survival. Uh, but, you know, by changing that relaxation time and getting the plant to go back in uh, and start growing sooner uh, after it's too bright, you know, we can increase plant productivity 20%. And there's quite a few of these techniques. So, uh, you know, I'll reveal my uh, optimism. This space with the proper investment, uh, there's a lot that can be done. And as you drive productivity, you can take uh, land out of cultivation like's happened in the U.S. and it, you know, forests regrow there. And the, you know, the malnutrition and incredible food problem we already have in Africa, which gets worse with population change and climate. These seeds are really the only hope uh, that we have to do the equivalent of the Green Le Revolution uh, from the 1960s and 70s. So explain, and this is something that struck me, um, explain why people should know about the organization called Consultative Group for International Agricultural Research, CGIAR, not to be mistaken for cigar. Yeah, why no, it's, it's kind of an obscure group, but this is where the seed work gets done. The two most famous centers are uh, the one that works on wheat and maize, which is corn, uh, that's down in Mexico, that's Simiot, and that's where Borlaug did his work, uh, partly to avoid diseases, but then he saw the way he did his shuttle breeding, uh, he took out this limit the plant had on when it would was willing to grow. So if you added fertilizer, it was mind blowing. And then it was so so productive that the stock would bend. So he had to breed in these Japanese varieties, uh, dwarf varieties to, so that it wasn't uh, as high. Anyway, an amazing story. The other CG uh, center that's well known is in the Philippines and that's where the rice work gets done. Uh, and, you know, again, they're, you know, they're very strong, but, and they can use these new techniques, uh, you know, assuming we, uh, get people uh, comfortable with this. Some of the things are called gene editing or well, some are called GMOs, some are just gene editing. That definition varies by country. Uh, you know, we can also put more nutrients into these crops. And so seeds are just so underinvested. Uh, you know, we owe it to the farmers in these developing countries uh, to help them deal with climate change and thank goodness there's this highly leveraged, high impact way if we could get that funding from a billion a year up to say 2 billion a year. So let me switch the topic to the urgency of the matter. Um, you have asked, um, you know, R&D, the federal government R&D to be increased by 5X. 
and you know, and these uh, to reduce the green premium and increase the innovation supply. And and you all and and you wrote beautifully about about how scale matters. But the issue is the innovation supply chain because we need policy to create the demand, and you got innovation supply and there's a supply chain, and which is where the scaling really happens and other factors come in, and. And you have created breakthrough energy ventures to invest in some amazing companies that I've seen. And so the question is, how do you reduce the time period? Because we don't have much time. So that brings to the, the next question by Shin Kun. Hi, Mr. Gates. I'm Shin Kun, a computer science PhD student at Stanford, focusing on data-driven methods for informing policy. My question for you today is this. Given the costly process it takes to revamp infrastructure, to bring energy R&D to wide adoption and to build institutional incentives and support. What bold actions or demonstrations do you think can fully accelerate the innovation ecosystem and overcome infrastructure and policy obstacles? Thank you. Yeah, it, this is you know, partly why some days the, the 2050 goal uh, seems like it's gonna be very hard to achieve because even for passenger cars, you know, if you get the green premium to zero by 2035, you know, then you have to retire all those vehicles. So that one, which is the furthest along, just barely makes it. Uh, all the other ones like that expanded electricity grid, steel cement, we really haven't invented everything we need. Uh, you know, can we make uh, green hydrogen that's super, super, super cheap? And that might, if so, then there's a way of using that as an input, say, to steel making, fertilizer making, and you know, it's it's kind of magic, but we can't count on that. And you know, there are so many steel plants, there are so many cement plants. The cement you don't like to move it long distances, and there's usually limestone very nearby, uh, and so it's everywhere. Uh, you know, in India, brick kilns, which also are high emitting, you know, they're everywhere, and. And so when you think, okay, if in 10 years we know what to do and it's gotten, you know, it's an approach that's close to uh, zero premium, can you actually even in 20 years get that deployed? Uh, people like Vaslav uh, Smile tell me that, you know, it's never happened that fast before. He's written so much great stuff about the uh, historical shifts. And so, you know, he, he, provides a, a sense of realism, uh, you know, and that's why I say this will be the hardest thing we've ever done. And if we waste any years because, you know, we're politically confused or if the younger generations, you know, picks other priorities and isn't driving this hard in both parties uh, and the world, uh, then I, you know, I, I don't think we're likely to, to make the goal. Let me switch the topic to environmental justice because uh, I'm so glad and thank you for writing the whole chapter on adaptation. And you have done this in the context of environmental justice equity, especially on the international landscape. And you talk about Kenya, Tanzania, we know about the case of what could happen in Bangladesh. Um, this was you know, in the Biden transition, this was almost a daily topic because this is, was so important to him and he elevated the issue and this brings to the next question, but it's, it's really about why is this important to you? And there's a question from someone from Tanzania. Let's get Maysom. Hey, Bill. Thanks so much for taking my question. I'm Maysom. I'm from Tanzania, and I'm a senior in electrical engineering here at Stanford. I have to say I'm a big fan of the work you and the folks at the foundation do, especially in places like Tanzania. Countries like my own have experienced the disproportionate impact of climate change, but can realistically do very little to change this. And so my question for you is, what should the role of developing countries be in charting the climate future for the world? Well, you're exactly right. Uh, you know, Tanzania has lots of uh, farmers, you know, who've got very limited uh, uh, acreage. Uh, it's got a quite a high population growth uh, and uh, it's near enough to the equator that these, uh, the tough weather, including very high absolute temperatures and high humidity, uh, will be reducing productivity and, and causing uh, crop failures way more often than it does today. You know, Tanzania uh, can take the output. If we really rev up 
the sort of global seed system, then you actually have in each country, the National Agricultural Research Center, it's called the NAR, that takes those general things and adapts it specifically for the local farmers. And it gives, the government gives advice to those farmers, uh, you know, does demonstration plots, uh, so those farmers get involved. And so certainly in the agricultural sector, you know, Tanzania can do its part. Uh, you know, we're going to Tanzania and saying, hey, some of your policies won't allow these new seeds to get used. And is that really the right trade-off? It's, you know, of course, their decision, but some scientists now in Tanzania are speaking out about uh, how critical this will be. So we owe it to Tanzania uh, to innovate. Also, to the degree there is a green premium, you know, the poorest 80 countries or so, we ought to be willing to subsidize that. But, you know, to fit our budgets, you know, you have to get that green premium down very, very dramatically. You know, the one thing I don't like is imposing uh, emission constraints on poor countries that the rich countries themselves aren't yet meeting. You know, so we say, oh, you just use solar power, even though it's, it's intermittent. In East Africa, there's geothermal, uh, you know, there's wind, there's a variety of things that if the grid is done right, I can see uh, how they become uh, energy self-sufficient with uh, very, very low cost. But, it, you know, it's going to take planning and it takes uh, Ethiopia, Kenya, Tanzania working together to make that reliable grid. I'm going to come back to this later on, but I want to talk about government. Um, your last but one chapter is a plan for getting to zero. Um, and you explained that technology solutions are necessary, but not sufficient. Policy matter matters. Governments matter, both national, state, local. Uh, leadership matters. Um, your zero goal is the same as that of President Biden. So what would you suggest to President Biden? What should he be doing now? And what would be your recommendations to Congress, to state governments, to public utility commissions? What is your recommendation? Let's start with President Biden. Yeah, well, it's fantastic. And you know, thanks for your work on the transition team. Uh, you know, the Biden administration has adopted this as one of its top four goals, and they placed people who uh, not only care about climate, but they're quite sophisticated about climate in many of the roles, not just the climate roles. So the National Economic Council, you know, Brian Deese, you know, strong climate person from the uh, Obama uh, White House. And, you know, I, I've started talking uh, with these people, and it's great to see the energy and the commitment as part of this uh, Build Back Better initiative. Uh, and so there's a lot of demonstration projects uh, that can be done. You know, this is an opportunity, hopefully, uh, to get some of those transmission projects going that haven't uh, been funded. You know, the US should play in this green hydrogen opportunity. After all, we've got essentially the, among the cheapest natural gas in the world. And, you know, that's an approach uh, that would give that industry, you know, at least some role, you know, you can convert pipelines to carry green hydrogen. And anyway, you know, I'm thrilled that now this demand side uh, for the innovation that we're going to have policies that go even further uh, than we've had before. The tax credits have been good. You know, Department of Energy, you know, RPE was a great idea. Now it's the stimulus bill, the one that was passed uh, in December, uh, got it up uh, to the kind of level you and I've talked about for a long time. Uh, so that was that was better than most people would realize. The nuclear area uh, got a lot of uh, um, authorization uh, for things like the, the terror power uh, demonstration plant. And so building on that, uh, this administration can do a lot. You know, now there'll be pushback, you know, our, you know, does this help all the communities? Uh, and, you know, that lens and learning about environmental justice, that was a new thing to me. The White House has for the first time, Dr. Martinez, who's there uh, to make sure that's incorporated into these plans. You know, the degree to which local water pollution, air pollution ended up uh, in the, um, uh, the low-income communities affecting people of color by far disproportionately, I didn't have uh, the awareness of that. So it's wonderful that you know, as we're doing these plans, we start uh, to have that in our, our mind. If you think globally, 
uh, the injustice you know, is also very strong because it's the poorest countries that are suffering. Uh, those are you know, near the equator, whereas it's the rich countries where historically the US uh, is the biggest emitter. Uh, you know, we've caused the problem and yet they're uh, the ones who suffer. So there's a lot of justice uh, considerations uh, that this plan has to, to take into account. Well, you are in the private sector, and and we have a government that is 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 leaning into this uh, issue on climate. So then that brings us to the next question by the student, uh, Kavya's question. Hi, Mr. Gates. Thank you for taking my question. My name is Kavya. I'm a second year Earth Systems student with a focus in human environmental systems here at Stanford. And my question for you today is what do you believe is the best way for the private and public sectors to work together on the climate crisis so that we can harness the power that both hold in our society? Thank you so much. Well, the private sector um, has, you know, the great skills, uh, you know, organizing risk capital, organizing complex engineering projects. You know, even the oil companies, if they choose, uh, have skill sets that like, you know, putting carbon underground, getting waste underground, uh, you know, using various approaches for green hydrogen, their engineering capability should be drawn into those things. Uh, the tech companies, you know, now are really stepping up and saying, okay, we want uh, not just sort of green energy where we bought a, a certificate, but we want to never have uh, uh, dirty electrons coming in uh, to power the data center. So they're pioneering buyers of various storage solutions. Even when they build buildings, you know, I, I'm talking to them about, okay, insist on green steel and green cement. Yes, it'll cost you more, but, you know, overall, you, you uh, got to be a good citizen and, and help drive these things forward. Uh, and so that dialogue about what the private sector can do on its own is great. I don't, without the right government policies though, the high green premium stuff will never uh, get on the learning curve. You know, so the magic of what happened in solar can happen in this uh, short time period that we have. And so we have to be willing, uh, you know, the tax credit uh, amount, you know, we'll have to, you know, maybe even double. Uh, the amount going into energy R&D, you know, I've set an ambitious goal to say, why isn't a, a priority at the level of our health research investment, which is 35 billion a year. And, you know, depending on how you define it, our current energy uh, is like 6 billion to 12 billion, uh, depending on, on how strict your definition is. The government's a big buyer. Uh, and so it can start you know, uh, like California did with low carbon fuels or with zero emission vehicles, you know, that those programs have been quite beneficial. And it's impressive that a state was willing to do that. Uh, now, you know, we can take those learnings and bring them up to the federal level. Uh, so it's going to take policy. The one thing I'd say about policy that scares me a tiny bit is if we have good policies for four years and then we don't have good policies for four years, it's very hard when you tell somebody who's building power plants and transmission lines or, you know, steel plants, okay, you know, every four years or so, you know, these incentives aren't going to be there. And so hopefully we can have the core of this, uh, you know, get to be uh, bipartisan and, you know, the advocates, the younger generation is, is going to have to play a big role there to make sure that we're not flip-flopping on the importance of this. Uh, in these three decades. I'm glad you said that because the, the two, four, six, eight cycle is not quite conducive for long-term predictable signals from the private sector. So I'm so glad you said that. Your last chapter is on individual actions and what we can do individually. And what are, in your mind, what are the one or two most important personal choices or steps that individuals can take to address climate change? Well, the first is your your voice uh, politically, and I'm not just meaning how you vote. Uh, if you learn about the issue, you're passionate about the issue, you see, you know, the negative effects, the opportunity, uh, you know, share that with other people. You know, you get extra credit if it's uh, people from both political parties that you're, you know, creating a sense of understanding and a uh, a sense that you know, with the right 
effort, uh, this is a solvable problem. Uh, the second is that you're a buyer. Uh, you can buy an electric car, you can buy uh, meat uh, from Impossible or Beyond or many others that are coming into that space. Uh, and that drives up the volume and you know the quality of those products will, will go up, uh, the cost will come down. Uh, the pace there has actually surprised me uh, that, that that category is, is at least there's a glimpse of how uh, it can get solved. There'll be more and more products where you'll have reporting about how green the company is and uh, you can uh, have your, your preference there. Uh, finally, you know, you're an employee. And so uh, your organization, uh, tech company, finance company, uh, you know, you should make sure that their skills, you know, their best people are engaging in this problem, that the products they're buying, that their, you know, scope three emissions reporting is, is, is very, very strong and that they're upping the quality of how this offset uh, work is going on. Uh, people need to feel engaged that, uh, you know, they, and, 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 you know, with the green premiums, hopefully we give them something that every year they can hear about some great new companies and they can see the progress in this concrete numeric way. So my last question uh, uh, is on COVID. And I mean, you have spent so much time on, on, on pandemics and, and sometimes, you know, some of the lessons are relevant, some of them are not relevant. So if you could dissect this a little bit to say, what lessons have COVID-19 taught us for climate change? And where do you think it is risky to apply COVID lessons for climate change? Yeah, well, COVID and, and climate change, uh, they share the characteristic. There are things that we expect our government uh, to think ahead uh, and plan for so that we don't get into a disastrous situation. You know, government does that for earthquakes with building codes. Uh, they do it for war by having uh, big defense budgets and they do war games. Uh, and in both the case of pandemic and climate, we're not there yet. Uh, the pandemic, a little bit of work before the pandemic about how quickly you roll out diagnostics would have made the United States more like Australia than what we ended up being, which, you know, is 10 times worse. So. It's a bit embarrassing that in many respects, uh, the US, despite the great skills of the CDC and the NIH and the FDA, uh, we were not a model. Now there's one thing we did right, which is we funded R&D and we funded it very rapidly. So, you know, what was called BARDA, uh, most of the money to make these vaccines, put Pfizer aside because they funded their own, but the next four vaccines, it was large checks from BARDA. The next biggest funder, which was about a third the size, is a group called CEPI that our foundation and others are in. But the BARDA money was absolutely necessary. Now, sadly, the pandemic uh, is something that, a, one, uh, compared to climate change, it's much easier to solve. Because even though we didn't prepare, uh, now these vaccines you know, show us that by the end of the year, uh, the infection rate will be dramatically down and we'll be on a path, particularly if we can vaccinate the whole world uh, that still uh, you know, could take us a while longer if we're not uh, smart about that, uh, this will end. Whereas with climate change, you can't wait until people start dying because by then the legs in the system and the die off of the natural ecosystems, you know, the coral reefs, the uh, the you know, farming productivity near the equator, this will be uh, uh, irreversible in a lot of the damage that it does. So we're asking people in this one to invest ahead of the problem. And we're asking them, we're not, it's not one breakthrough. Uh, you know, people say, which breakthrough do I like? And you know, I, I love them all. You know, I like long-term storage, I like green hydrogen, but the, the key point of the book is that you have to have solutions across all the spaces. It was a 50% reduction. Hey, fine, pick half of them and just punt. But this is a 100% reduction. And so it's so much harder uh, than the pandemic, but the kind of global cooperation, which has uh, mostly been pretty good in the pandemic, uh, calling on the science community, 
calling on the private sector. You know, Pfizer, uh, they picked a German company, very small company who was early, uh, but had this mRNA thing. And it was a brilliant choice that they made. Now they're, you know, I have phone calls with them regularly, they're collaborating together. So, uh, you know, some negative lessons, uh, several from the US government about speaking out openly about how bad it was gonna be, you know, always minimizing the situation, accessing people who weren't uh, experts uh, to get involved. Uh, but, uh, you know, I, I do think government, uh, you know, the lessons of the pandemic are there and several of them apply uh, to this effort. So quick answer, I know we're running out of time and this is Stanford related, as you know, Stanford has been working in energy and climate issues for two decades. Um, and now we're starting a new school on climate and sustainability, which is we don't often start new schools, but this is important. What advice would you have in starting this new school? And what advice would you have for undergraduate and graduate students? Quick answer on that and we'll wrap up. Well, it's fantastic that Stanford's doing that uh, and that you've you know, encouraged your donors to give you the resources to bring a Stanford level of expertise to these problems. And, you know, the fact that Stanford can integrate, you know, understanding of climate, understanding of chemistry, physics, these are very multidisciplinary things. Uh, it's partly why it's a hard one to understand, partly why, you know, I get a kick out of climate because you, the number of things you have to learn to understand climate are very large, even economics, uh, God, God forbid, uh, you know, needs to, to be part of how you structure uh, the solution here. So I'm, I'm thrilled to have uh, Stanford stepping up. You know, I hope you'll concentrate on the hard parts of the problem as well as the ones that are uh, further along. Uh, you know, the way that universities work with the private sector always uh, requires some creativity uh, to make sure you're drawing on the strengths of each and you, you know when things are, you know, in the public, and when they become sort of, uh, you know, licensed IP, but you know, Stanford has a, a lot of great experience there. The health field, the health field does give us some good examples of how this works, where you've got the NIH funding, and you know, we the progress in health uh, has been fantastic, and I'm you know very optimistic about uh, the next several decades there. So we should we should draw on all of that. Uh, you know, hopefully, your best and brightest students will find this is an attractive field to go in. Uh, you know, it, it, this is a, somebody could start a career today and they would have plenty of hard work <laughs> for their entire life uh, working on these issues. This is not a, a flash in the pan type uh, opportunity. Bill, this was a terrific conversation. Thank you for spending the hour with us. And you have explained in your book how hard this challenge is to get to zero. You have not sugarcoated this issue. Um, and a global change at this massive scale is historically unprecedented. We have never done this before, but we have to do it. That's the, that's the calling that, that you have laid out. And you also, so I, I was schizophrenic reading this book because it, it is terrifying to see how big the challenge, but the, also your optimism of, of the holistic com comprehensive approach to address climate change. And it, at the end of the day, it's all about us. We have to decide individually and collectively through a government, through organizations. So I hope all listening out here get a chance to read this important and timely book from, from Bill Gates, How to Avoid a Climate Disaster. And I wanna take this opportunity to thank the 150 students who submitted questions for Bill. Unfortunately, we could pick only six of them. We will share all the rest of the questions with Bill. And finally, I wanna thank the team at Stanford Precode Institute for Energy the Stanford Woods Institute for the Environment and the team at Gates Ventures for the effort in putting this together. And we will now conclude this broadcast of today's program on behalf of the entire Stanford Precord Institute for Energy and the Woods Institute for Environment. We thank you for joining us and thank you again, Bill, for joining us. It was terrific. Thank you.